Here's the second episode, and I'm so sorry the audio quality is so bad. Calling China and talking to these people in China is a real challenge because the other person has to be on a bunch of different VPNs just to get the thing to work because China's so blocked. I promise to make an effort to try and improve the audio quality in the future. Hey, my name's Dave Andrews, better known as Skadoosh on the forums and YouTube and Facebook pages and whatnot, so on and so forth. Um, I live and work and do business in China. And uh, I fly quads. <laughs> where, where do you, you sound, you have no accent or anything. Where are you actually from? I was born in the middle of Minnesota, but um, I moved to Florida wow. when I was very young and was raised in Florida on the beach side. So going from a small beach town to um, 14 million people in a Chinese city was quite a culture shock for me. Yeah, that's a huge shock. So what drove you to China? Why did you go there? Well, what happened was, is I was working for a company um, building, uh, what we build is like um, a hyped up golf cart, like um, custom style golf carts. We build them for like Disney World to feed the animals and like drink carts and um, people movers for like um, resorts and hotels. We build the uh, specialty food carts and like carts for the maid service for the big resorts, things like that. We don't actually build golf carts, but they're on like a golf cart chassis style. That's... And what happened was, is we had hooked up with a company in, um, we actually partnered up with somebody in China and we started importing some cars um, from the company here in China. And the first probably 100 cars we got, and this will feed right into to what we're going to go into, probably the first 100 cars we got were absolutely beautiful. And then they started degrading quickly, and we started having issues with steering and wiring, and we couldn't figure out what was going on. So the company asked me, um, well, you go to China for a couple weeks because I was the um, at that time I was the production floor manager for the um, building the cars over there in, in in Florida. And they said, "Well, you go to China for a couple weeks and see if you can straighten everything out. You know, retrain them how to build these cars correctly." So I came over here. Um, was supposed to be for two weeks. Um, worked in the in, with our partner factory over here with our Chinese partners. And when I flew back to America, they were so impressed with what I did. They said, um, do you want to just go live in China and run that factory? And we'll pay for you to move there and everything. I was, I was um, just divorced and separated. And sure, why not? I got nothing else going on. So I landed here in China with a suitcase and um, went to work with the Chinese partners and um, they weren't willing to bring things up to the scale that we needed them to do. So um, I started seeking suppliers and things by my sense. And long story short, I have now acquired my own Chinese business license, my own China export license, and I have my own facility without any Chinese partners. I run everything. That's and awesome. That is, that is like the only way. You can get really good products out of China. If you're willing to put your boots on the ground, you have to be on top of every move. And that's why guys like, you know, that's why guys like Waz and Trappy are over here. Because, they, you know, you can turn out good products as long as you're willing to, to dig and stay on top of everything. Like, like for, for me, myself, and, and that's why, you know, like guys like um, Underground FPV, uh, Team Black Sheep, that's why they're here. That's why they have boots on the ground. So they can double check all their suppliers' product periodically, you know. What I do is I'll just hop on the bullet train and go around to my suppliers and just pop into their factory in the middle of stuff, you know, when I know I got a big order rolling or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, so, like, in this, in this entire industry, in the whole sport, hobby, whatever, it's like you don't actually know what on earth you're getting. And especially when you buy from Banggood or some Chinese website, you have no clue what it is. So, it's just, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah it, it is such a roll of the dice because these guys will buy parts in the bucket load, recycled parts. They buy them by the kilo. Yeah, just throw stuff together. 
And the trouble with all of it is that, like, I mean, people are spending a lot of money on this crap, and if, you, like, I'm gravitating towards people that I am personally speaking with that I know are overseeing the production of this stuff, and that's why Team Black Sheep is really has value over so many other brands, because Trappy is freaking there. Him and his guys are there overseeing everything constantly, so you know your VTX is going to work, and it's like, no, Absolutely. You don't I'm good friends with them all. Trappy and I hang out all the time. I know his whole crew. I know the whole deal. And that's just it. You know, I if you're if you wanna if you think you're gonna go on Banggood and save ten bucks on a on a frame or a board or a VTX, you know, you're rolling the dice. You're rolling the dice and you're not gonna get it, the support and backup. And these guys are not moving the industry forward. They're just copying what's already out there. So you might, you know, my money, my money is better spent for the guys that are innovating. You know, underground FPV, Team Black Sheep, these guys that are that are actually doing it and moving forward. You know, that's yeah. good view on it. So I understand that you made your own frame. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that took um, that took quite some time. Again, going through, um, I went to. The, the main thing that was the carbon fiber of it. I had the layout in my head of what I wanted, but um, again, you know, boots on the ground. I went to several carbon fiber shows, um, you know, and met with dozens of different carbon fiber suppliers and had a few that I liked, and they cut prototypes for me. And, you know, one guy said his was unbreakable, and I got it, and, like, it was unbreakable, but it was also, like, um like rubber, like the whole thing just, <laughs> I could bend the thing in a U shape and it wouldn't break, but it was unflyable because it would flap through the air like a, a butterfly. <laughs> 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 so that's the, the challenge of China. Yeah, so I understand that you made this just for yourself, like you really just wanted your own freaking product that worked that you didn't have to worry about. I did, I did. The, the whole original deal was... Um, I, I have a, um, and, and I'll tell you straight out, I have a frame that I use for racing that is a, a clone frame, but I've never, ever offered it to anybody else, and I've been cutting those myself for um, probably a year, and it will never be for sale or never be on the market. I just cut them for myself because I can get them for about $12 a piece, so when I beat the crap out of them on a racetrack, it doesn't matter. I just throw them on another frame and you know, I buy a dozen of them at a, sh you know, a whole board of them at a shot. And so I wanted something for freestyle, something that was going to hold up to, you know, bashing into trees and, you know, so on and so forth. And it kind of, um, it kind they kind of mesh together. So w what's the, like, the FTV scene look like over there in China? Like, how alive is it? Oh my God! It's a totally different world. It's a totally different world. I, I just last weekend I went to a race. This is an example. I went to a race in Nanjing, that was an invite only, and it was sponsored by the local. We lost connection several times, which I edited out. But this was another instance, and it was telling me about how the Chinese government will actually fund people that want to fly these things full time, and about how incredibly large the FPV scene is in China. And then we started discussing about how positive China and its government is about FPV and these this this whole sport in general. That that that's just that, that's that's so shockingly incredible. Like it's it's I, I can't believe the rest of the world is so crazy against it. Is it is could it be just that like China's kind of just like like they don't care what happens? They're just like, yeah, do whatever you want. <laughs> Well, that's part of it. I mean, China's pretty lawless. They don't even like obey basic traffic laws here. I mean, people just yeah. go the opposite direction, blasting their horn. But um, the you know the other part of it is is the socialism. You know, that's big business for China. There's billions, and you know everything everything we fly is made here. <laughs> you know, yeah. so that's big for them. The other the other thing is. You can, you can, I, I mean, you can pretty much fly here wherever you want as long as you, you know, use some decent judgment, but, but nobody really cares. There's, we, there's not, in, the only incidents we've ever had here, the DJI automated drones, and that's the only laws that China really has set in place is for the automated 
style um, drones, not not quads, not models like we fly. I think I think it's two separate categories myself because anybody can go buy a DJI, read the pamphlet and put it up in the air and you move the stick and it goes here and stays there and you move the stick and it goes there and stays there. We're like what we do, you know, first of all, you have to learn how to build and tune one. And then it takes skills to fly it. You know, it takes putting in some time. You can't just go to the store and grab one and be up in the air in an hour. So, and like, the only... So this is stuff that the government actually understands? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. The laws they have here are only for the automated drones. You have to register the automated, you know, DJI, G- anything with, like, a GPS automated. You have to register. Wow. And, they, you know, of course, then they have the block areas and stuff like that. But, like, this event that I was at, They paid for a five-star hotel. They paid for all our transportation. They paid for all our meals. They paid for everything for us to go there. That's incredible. That's just, that's mind-blowing. What, why is the government doing this? So we had dinner with the mayor. You know, he came and shook my hand. I put the goggles on him. He was looking through the, you know, he was looking at the frame that I designed. He's like, wow, that's really cool. You know, from what I can, you know, I speak basic Chinese, survival Chinese. But, what is it, do you have any idea what their strategy or their goal is with this? They, um, they, they really, there's, there's an organization in China that's a government organization. It's called ASFC, and it's Aerial Sports Federation of China, and they just totally promote the hobby. You know, I, I don't know the. One thing is, like, I fly for, um, I fly for, a, it's kind of like the uh, Chinese version of DRL. It's called XFly. And we do, you know, we go into, like, auditoriums and stuff like that. And they have all the LEDs. And it's total camera coverage. Um, we fly through the clear, clear views so they can have the footage from the drones. They have cameras set up everywhere. And they stream it live and they put it on television here. Why? Why don't? Why don't we know anything about this? Can you like get recordings and videos? Like, can we see? Like, this is this is so mind blowingly new that like while we're here in the Western world trying to get more people involved and we're trying to grow the whole industry, all of a sudden China comes along like, oh yeah, by the way, we have millions of people doing this already and nobody knows. It's a it's a big deal here. Like, um, I get nervous sometimes because, like, one of the last X Fly races we flew was on top of a mall, and like we could see <laughs> the airport actually landing at the airport, the Hongqiao Airport next to us. Um, and they have bleachers up, and there's like a crowd. There's like a crowd of people in the bleachers all the way around us, like cheering and stuff. It's like so. It's like. You know, uh, <laughs> it's very different from me racing in the field and, and figure, you know, practicing. Then you go in front of the crowd and the cameras and you're up on a stage and they have a big screen, uh, like a huge, giant 20 by 40 screen behind us with all the coverage, all the pilots, flight footage, you know, the, the live coverage so that everybody in the crowd can see what's going on. It's crazy. Have you seen DRL? Have you watched DRL? Yeah, I get I get some of the... um. I can't get ESPN or anything like that, but I get the feeds, you know, and, and I'm friends how, with Conrad and, and some, and the guy, you know, Nurk and everybody that flies. Yeah. There. How so, similar is it? It's on a smaller scale. The, the tracks are, are similar, I would say, but not as big. We don't do like um, Miami stadium. These tracks are, you know, hard to fly with a five inch, more of a three or four inch style type uh-huh. track. So they're tight. What's the skill level like? Uh, it, it's top, definitely top. <laughs> because I mean, like, is there a lot, a lot of top top pilots? Oh yeah, I fly with. I've flown with Luke Bannister with um with Freybot. Uh, Ming Chung Kim was just here from Korea three weeks ago. I flew with him, and that, that kid is just mind boggling fast. I mean, this track was this track was half the size of a soccer field and he was going through it full throttle through gates like the size of a hula hoop how <laughs> how do the chinese people match up how do they stack up are they comparable chinese uh, pilots? oh yeah absolutely uh usually i would say i would say most of the time like when luke came here he won he beat everybody out but the guy right behind him was chinese um, it's, it's, it's fairly close. Um, they, you know, they put their time in you know, when, when, uh, when the Chinese get 
my, their mindset on something, you know, they practice it a lot. You know, that's just their type yeah. of, their type of, so it's such a, now, I mean, you can almost be like a celebrity in China for flying a quad, you know? There's nobody, I mean, Luke is the closest thing to a celebrity in the rest of the world, but like, how many are there people there that actually do this stuff? Full? Like there's like five or six people here in the Western world that, you know, do this stuff full time. This is, they call themselves full time drone pilots. Like, are oh, yeah. there, how many are there in China that do that? There's lots here. I mean, they're like, they're like super sponsored, you know, that like, is, uh, that's crazy. That's so crazy. So then why don't we get more innovation out of China themselves? Why, why is the innovation just stuck? Well, because, uh, hey, hey, let me back up just for a second. Like, um, T motor has a team here, TOS, and that's all they do. There's five pilots on that team and that's all they do is travel around China and race, but there's 10 times the amount of races here that there is over there. I mean, there's races constantly all over China. So, um, I say on your next question it's because part of it is because, you know, China always wants to be top dog. So I think until they have it at a level where they can say, look how freaking awesome we are, they're not going to um, break it loose into the rest of the world. Okay. You know that? But what, why is so like, there's a bunch of companies making these new goggles and things. Why does their product suck so much? I mean, if China is such a huge market, don't they want to make some stuff better for themselves? Yeah, but you have the, you have to, uh, uh, here's, here's the China, Chinese businessman mentality and it has nothing to do with like the government or anything. They want to pump out quantity and they give a crap less about quality. And that's one of the things why you have to have boots on the ground here to get stuff right. They would rather make a thousand half ass shit and sell it for a cheap ass price than make a hundred of really, really good ones and be able to get double the money. And that was part of the reason, main, one of the big reasons with, with um, my company being here, I was like, look, guys, people, that, well, we need to do this so it's not so expensive. We need to, no, 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 no. Americans, the Western world does not care about paying an extra few dollars for the quality. They don't want the quantity. They want stuff that works. But China business is totally upside down from what we understand in the Western world. Like... I go to a company and say, you know, I need this product made. Okay, great. We can make them. Okay, I need 100 of them. They say, no, we will not sell you 100. We will only sell you 1,000. If you don't like it, go somewhere else. Well, sure. That makes sense. <laughs> it's, it's, There's no customer service here. <laughs> so this this is a lot of the things. This is a lot of the, like, I have, I have developed stuff in China for, in the dental industry. And I have, I've, I've done a lot of stuff in China, but I've never fully understood all this until I really got involved with, with all these quads and, and the actual industry and figuring out where this stuff comes from and how to get better stuff. And like, I've wanted to develop a certain number of things, but uh, just this, this thing has just been holding me back because like, I know that I just don't understand China. I don't understand what it is there. And very, for the past like six, seven months, which is why I've been gravitating towards towards uh, manufacturers that I know, like TBS, and like I can say, yes, I know this person. I know they are controlling the quality. I know what I'm getting, and I use their stuff because I know what I'm getting. That's why I haven't been able. To, I haven't made anything. I haven't, I haven't really done much. I've just kind of you know consulted for everybody and just tried to improve the industry as a whole until I figured out what I was doing. Like now, now it's just the weird thing is that I feel like I'm getting closer and closer and I, and I like, I have a real job <laughs> and I, I don't really have time for all this, but it's just so damn interesting to hear all this and just try to figure out what on earth is going on over there and how well, these taken, companies are able to manage China so well. It's taken me like four years to get to where I'm at. And here, here's, I'll give you like an example of, of how it goes. Like I order a piece of aluminum and I want a three quarter hole drilled in it. Now I get a hundred of these that are absolutely beautiful, perfect three quarter hole. Everything's great. All of a sudden the next batch of 100, about halfway through what's going on here. The hole is now seven ace and it's egg shaped. <laughs> so, so what happens is they have Joe farmer that they're paying $20 a week and all the, all the rice he can eat drilling holes. And Joe, the farmer doesn't know that that drill bit is only good for 500 holes. He will keep drilling with that drill bit until it's smoking. 
<laughs> so that's that's an example. You know, you have to. I have. You know, I constantly visit my factories and walk in, and you know, all my suppliers okay. walk in and look and see what they're using, see what they're doing, see what their quality control is like. So I've gone through. I can't even countless, countless, countless suppliers until I found ones that I can rely on. Like the guy that makes my aluminum now, he worked for a German company for years, and he's Chinese, and he's a great guy, but I can trust him. I know he knows what type of quality I'm looking for. Wow. So the, the, the biggest difference I see between that and, like, the Western world is that we don't have people that just, like, if I wanted to make something, there are there isn't, like, a thousand companies lined up waiting to make me my product. It's like, it? okay, there's, like, three companies, and they'll make you decent stuff, but they're going to charge you quite a bit for it. And it's like competition is just lacking. And it's, it's so weird that China, like everybody does something. Everybody is striving to do something. And like, it's just, there's a lot of good things and a lot of bad things. China's not all hundred percent evil. So how safe is it there? It's not, it's not, you got, you have to be fully focused and fully aware when you, I mean, as far as like, um, you know, that, and that's just on the traffic end of it. But as far yeah. as like a social end of it, you know, like um, as far as people go and like petty crime and stuff like that, it's like pretty much non-existent. I mean, I can oh. go into the store and buy some stuff and leave it hanging on the bag on the handlebars of my scooter and nobody's going to touch it. Really? That's so weird. How come? Well, I, I think it's because... You know, the cops do look the other way here. The government doesn't. These people can, go, you know, if, if the poor people here, one thing, that, one thing is, is there's limited, the, the drug scene is not here. If you get caught smuggling drugs here, you go straight in front of the firing squad. So wow. you had that end of it. The other thing is, is they let these people hustle. You know, they'll let them put up a street stand and, and sell the fruit from the back of their house. You know, they'll let them make pancakes and street food, you know, they, they'll let them do what they have to do to survive. Or if you try to put up, you know, if I tried to sell hot dogs on the corner back home where I'm from in Sarasota, I would be there about five minutes before the cops chased me away. Same thing here in LA. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's the same deal. But, um, here's the thing that I see, like on this, like, you know, I'm American in China. Now I see on the American side, it's almost the big brother factor looking over your shoulder, cops on every corner, you know, pulling is almost overbearing. We're on the China end. It's almost like I can see why there's some of these laws in place because these people just do whatever the hell they want. And it's crazy that, you know, I came around the corner on the highway and there's a dump truck coming at me the wrong way, beeping his horn because he missed his exit and made a U-turn in the middle of the highway. <laughs> so, I would say there needs to be, you know, somewhere in the middle ground is, is where people should actually aim for. Well, are you planning on getting more into the, the FPV market as in developing stuff or talking to factories and figuring things out over there? Well, you know, I'm very well connected in the market over here, but I stay low on it. You know what I mean? I just um, yeah. do what I do for them and give them my feedback so that they can, you know, move forward with their their production. I have a whole box of Maytech stuff sitting here in front of me that they just sent me, as a matter of fact. These new mini boards. Gosh, I talk to Samson so much. I, I really wanted to start making ESC so they can make all-in-one boards. We need we definitely need more all-in-one board options. Yes, I agree with you. The all-in-one that would... Uh, ESC that would plug straight into that F405 would be... I told him the same thing. We're on the same page. Yeah, and he's, he says that he, he's going... He's thinking about it and he's looking into it. But it still hasn't happened yet. They it's, make great products. They're, they're always willing to move forward. They're not that typical Chinese company. And he's only he's only uh, forty five minutes away from me. Same thing with Zhong. Zhong Zhong. All you guys call him Zhong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Zhong. Um, HQ Props. You know, they're like forty five minutes away from me. Oh, Zhong and I, many. Times. You have do you have any right. idea how they make props? Like, how do they come up with these designs and make the actual props? Do you have any idea? Like, do they use software? Uh, do they have a particular engineer? Yes, there's a lot of facets to it. I, I don't know how much I should elaborate. Um, Zhang is pretty, he won't even sell, you know, unless you know him personally, you can't even get HQ props in China. Wow. Wow. You know, you know somebody or buy them through, through some other outside company, he won't, like, sell them inside of China. Like, um, 
Like even when he gives me prototype stuff to try, which he gives me bags of stuff. And, um, he, he says, do not give these to any Chinese. They're for, you know, you test them, you tell them what you want. <laughs> you know, so what's just, the most popular prop there? King Kong? You can buy a Dell prop. Oh, so then that's where Dell's biggest market must be then. Because oh, yeah. they sell like three to 400,000 sets of props a month. Gem fan is also huge here, and I'm I'm good friends with all those guys too. A gem fan. Wow. Uh, have you tried uh, uh, HQ's new five by four five by three? It's coming out supposedly very soon. Need to get get some. Last time I flew an HQ prop was when um, Chad Nowak and Steel were here, and Capper and um, Sean Taylor. We had a um, Zong came and we he, we rented a private soccer field because he had a bunch of prototype props for us all to try out. And we sat there half the night just burning up props and seeing what they would do. And that's the last time I used an HQ because, like you, just um, for me, I fly. I like to fly high KB motors, and the HQ props tend to flap mm-hmm. at the at the higher end. Um, yeah. They don't, you know, they flatten out, and then they there's no no tuning that you can get rid of that. The uh, the new five by five by three has been really good for me i think it's it's a it's it's definitely one of the best if not the best prop that they've made but i really want it in a four or five pitch but i'm also worried that the four or five pitch will flatten out at high high kv because the material like right. the material doesn't hold up but at least the five pitch has this like fold on it so that it keeps this cone shape as it goes yeah your style and what you like to fly is right along the same lines of what i like to use i don't know we'll see well, I, I, i'm actually going to get in contact with jong today because i saw your video i i've been begging him for a year to make those six by three by threes because all they made before was the six by fours so i'm glad he finally yeah. put them because there's no other ones on the market the next yeah. option is the king kong two blades you know, and they work pretty well, but they're still not a tri blade, and they're they're stiff as crap and hard to tune. And you you know, building a six yeah. inch to tune enough without the jello in it. I forget. I was right. watching one of your videos a while back, and I com. This is where we got into this conversation because I I had commented and I was laughing at some of the things you were saying about China with you know people going over the border with money, and once the money's here, it doesn't go anywhere. Stuff like that. And it, it's so yeah, true. Is that true. Yeah, be so Gosh. true. Why do you why, think I should set up in Hong Kong right next to Shenzhen? Well, sure, but what? what God, what? Uh, aren't there police on that border? No. See, here's the deal. If you're a foreigner, if you're a China national, then you get shook down by customs. If you're a foreigner like me with an American passport, when I go over the Hong Kong border, I ride the train from Shenzhen to Hong Kong. And I walk up to a kiosk, and all I do is scan my passport and walk right through. Wow. wow. See, now, so China have to have a visa to go anywhere from the Chinese government. If they don't get a visa from the Chinese government, they will not let them out of the border. They can't go anywhere without a, the, a visa from here. They have to have a visa to go anywhere in the world. To leave the China border, a Chinese national has to have a visa, and they have to go through customs. So, could you make a business out of just living in China and smuggling money across the Hong Kong border? Probably. I, I would probably <laughs> say so. I have literally seen guys with money taped around their waist. Because once the money is here in China, it does not leave. It is stuck here. I can't even convert my RMB to American dollar. I have to have a Chinese do it so that it's monitored. I do, I'm developing the lithium batteries for my cars um, as we speak, and and I there's there's only a handful of factories that actually make the cells, and yeah. once they make um, once they make a cell, it goes into a huge huge giant room, and every cell gets tested. I've been in the factory. I've seen this. Every cell gets tested for the quality of how long it holds a charge, how quick it charges up, blah 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 blah. They get separated into batches. So now your your top guys that are willing to pay the money for the top cells, that's what they get, and they assemble those cells into the packs they send us. Now, you know, other guys down the line that aren't so hip on that, they may buy the top quality batch 
once and then they're going to buy the next notch down and the next notch down and the next notch down. So wouldn't it be relatively easy to just be the guy that buys the top battery and make that your battery product and just say you will always have the top because you always buy the best? Sure. That's why, you know, guys, you know, you have guys like uh, Lumineer packs or, you know, the TBS or, you know, some of the top, top packs. But um, then you see all these little battery companies that pop up constantly with, with sudden cheap batteries. And that's their thing. You know, maybe they were red zone last month and you bought some red zones and they were awesome. Then the quality went down. All they're going to do is rename the company um, Green Battery. And now the Green Batteries are <laughs> And they're great for a month, and all of a sudden they suck again. Now they're going to rename the company Blue Battery. And now you buy Blue Batteries, and they're awesome, and then a month later they suck. They just redo it over and over. That is long enough for this episode. I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to come back to you because the, the next two people that I have lined up is uh, actually one guy's uh, an MD. He is um, head of head of a medical department at UCLA, which I'm going to talk to about some pretty interesting things. And then another guy's a lawyer which is going to talk to me about um, the various drone cases that he's had in the United States and the other things that he's working on. Um, yeah, these are, these are things that I don't think anybody cares about over there in China. <laughs> no, they don't. But no, over here, it's like health and safety and all this stuff. I'm assuming that people are heavily interested in it. Um, but I'm going to come back to you later because you and uh, Underground FPV guys, and, uh, one of the one of the person are like the best English speaker sources that I have over there. And I'm <laughs> shocked to hear what the FPV scene is like over there. And I, I mean, I, I wish they could join the Western world. Like, it's sad that we don't know anything it, of it. It's like the laws for for unautomated UAVs is, you know. Don't fly near the trains. Use caution when flying over people. Um, and don't fly into airplanes. You know, use your discretion. That, that's like it. <laughs> that's so forward thinking. It's just crazy to realize that. Like, how are they so forward thinking about this stuff? That's amazing. But I guess, do, do any incidents happen? Have there been any incidents? That's the thing that I was just going to say. Worldwide. Worldwide, Bob. Has anybody been killed by a drone? Well, yeah, that one poor kid that sliced himself up with his helicopter. But aside from that, you know, is, is has any planes crashed? Has any cars been taken off the road? Has anybody's puppy died? <laughs> Worldwide. Yet, you know, there's there's a thousand people a year killed on an escalator. <laughs> you know, it, it, you know the. the 500 people got ran over by a bus yesterday. Is, is there any evidence of anybody dying from a quad? That's what just blows my mind about the whole thing. How can they impede these laws and regulations? There's no nothing, no evidence. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. That being said, a lot of the stuff that does happen that people do is just poor discretion. You can have poor is discretion and cause problems, I guess. Poor discretion? Pay the freaking price. Look, you're an idiot. Now you're getting fined. You're doing thirty days, you know, thirty days and whatever it may be, and, and and leave it at that. Wow. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna edit this because I got two other videos to edit as well too. All right. Thanks yeah, so much. Right. I'll Cut definitely gonna talk to you again. Definitely gonna talk to you. Hopefully one day I will, I will meet you and and uh, John and and Trappy and Underground guys. I'll we'll all be together and try to hang out. Absolutely. I'm I'm willing to fly to Hong Kong at any point. <laughs> well, actually, I'm hoping that uh, that somebody over there can get me kind of like come there as like a sponsored pilot for the Chinese government. <laughs> so I, can, I know that they <laughs> they gotta bring people over from the Western world. You know what? I might be able to pull that off. I might be able to get you a plane ticket on that. On that. Movie. Well, that and I would, I would, I would love to bring. I don't know why. Why on earth don't people make like you? YouTube episodes about this stuff like all these people vlogging like I want to watch a vlog about that I don't want to see a vlog about you know nothing driving down the freeway until I get to my spot so I can fly and then go home like that's most of the vlogs yeah. thing recorded and I was thinking about editing it editing it and doing the vlog thing I have the speeches and the whole nine There's so much footage I'll get to it eventually but definitely okay okay very good talking to you I will talk to you I, I will talk to you again soon ciao Okay, take care. Bye.